verily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord.
reading from the letter of Paul to the Galatians. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. And the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. The word of the Lord.
glory to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his <clears throat> disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? He turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow on his back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Pate, she said. Yes, on a French roll, I replied. It was Friday when I went to a usual sandwich shop for lunch, and it's nice when the woman behind the counter remembers your order. I asked her how she was doing that Friday noon, and she said, Tarot. I looked at her. And I nodded my head and said, I think I know why. I feel terrible as well. And I know that many of the people I know and love feel the same way. For this, of course, was just hours after on the West Coast we heard word of the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe versus Wade and leaving the legality and availability of abortion up to states. She continued working on my sandwich, and I said, can I ask you a question about this? She said, yes. I said, if you were in church on Sunday, what would you need to hear from me in the sermon? Her eyes got wet in the corners. And she said, my country doesn't value me anymore. I am hopeless. And then she broke down, weeping, excused herself to go to the back room of the shop. And a co-worker moved over and completed making my sandwich. I feel my country doesn't value me anymore. I am hopeless. The next day, I took my New York Times. 
out of the bag. And on the front page were two photographs below a very large banner headline saying row overturned. The top photo were men and women rejoicing, celebrating that a long desired and long fought for victory seemed to be won. And right below that photo was one of an equal size, men and women, dispirited, dejected, disappointed, angry. That a right that had been on the books for nearly 50 years was taken away just that quickly. If you prefer graphics to photographs, turning to the inside of the newspaper the same day was a map of these United States. A colorful map, different colors showing which states where abortion will remain legal, which states where it will be questionable, and which states where it will be or already is prohibited. My home state of Michigan was one of those indeterminate states. There is a law on the books in Michigan, Michigan um, that Roe versus Wade uh, overturned, the law that makes abortion illegal in Michigan the executive branch of the government um, has pledged not to enforce that 1936 law, I believe. There are no neat and tidy lines on this map. Yeah, the coasts roughly are one color, and parts of the midsection are others, but there's no nice, tidy way to categorize one particular chunk of the country or another. No neat lines. I suppose that is symbolic and emblematic of where we are as a country. In 1858, when he was running for the United States Senate from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln gave a speech. When he began that speech, a house divided against itself cannot stand. He went on in this 1858 speech to say that it cannot be half slave and half free, this country of ours. It will be all one or all the other, but it can't exist divided. Perhaps it will be by dint of force one way or another that the country will stand and not fall. Abraham Lincoln did not win the Senate seat in 1858, but he went on to be elected our 16th president. And not long after he was inaugurated, our second American Revolution, our bloody Civil War, began. took an awful lot of death and destruction and heartache and passion to bring the Union back together. Abraham Lincoln, of course, was not the first to use that line, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Other orators in this country and in England had used that line as well in the decades and centuries before Abraham Lincoln spoke. But of course, neither Lincoln nor they got this line out of the ether. It came from the lips of Jesus, the third chapter, the 25th verse of St. Mark's Gospel, where Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. He said this in response to the scribes and Pharisees who were claiming that it was by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, that Jesus was able to cast out demons. And Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And here we are in 
2022. And I stand before you this morning promising you that this sermon will not end up in a nice, neat, tidy bow. But I do have some thoughts based on the scriptures. Jesus knew something of conflict, of course. Jesus' life, especially in Mark's gospel, was one of conflict. Jesus would go on to say in the gospels that following him would cause dissension and division in families. Father against son, mother against daughter, mother-in-law against daughter. Later in Mark's Gospel, in the 13th chapter, when his country bumpkin disciples were awestruck and gobsmacked by the beauty and the grandeur of the temple in Jerusalem. Lord, look at how beautiful this place is. And Jesus said, the time will come when not one stone will be left upon another. And Jesus' core group of disciples asked him in private, tell us, Lord, when and how this will be. And Jesus launches into what is called the little apocalypse that we hear in Mark's gospel and also in Matthew and in Luke's, where Jesus talks about the signs and the portents and the things to come. And Jesus says when it happens, essentially head for the hills, because it's not going to be pretty. St. Mark's gospel, we think, was written somewhere around the year 70 A.D., around the time that the temple in Jerusalem indeed was destroyed, not one stone left on another. The hearers, the readers of Mark's gospel were living through this destruction in real time, remembering what Jesus had said 40 years before. And in today's scripture reading, we have readings about the cost of discipleship, of following Jesus on the way. It is presaged by the transfer of prophetic ministry and authority from Elijah to Elisha that we heard. Elijah was given the command by God to anoint a prophet in his place. After Elijah himself had caused quite a stir with King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and killed 450 of their prophets, the Lord commanded Elijah to anoint new kings and to be prophet, a new prophet in his place. And he happens upon Elisha, the one he is sent to, and throws his mantle, his cloak, his symbol of authority over the shoulders of Elisha. And Elisha, realizing what has happened, says, first, please let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Elijah bids him, grants him that permission, and bids him to return. And Elisha slaughters a yoke of oxen, builds a fire out of his plow, and feeds his people. And then he goes and follows as Elijah's disciple and apprentice. And soon enough, we'll carry that mantle fully when Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind to heaven. We pick up this theme in Luke's Gospel, where Jesus is making his way, and people want to join the movement. One person says to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go, and Jesus says the road is very hard, foxes have dens, Birds have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There is no rest in announcing the kingdom of God. Another man says, I will follow you. But first, first let me go bid farewell to my family. And Jesus says, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And the third call, the one in the middle, was not a volunteer. The one in the middle was one who Jesus had called. Did you get that distinction? Jesus said to him, come, follow me. 
And the person said, I will, but first let me go bury my father. Fulfill that filial duty. Fulfill a commandment. Honor thy father and mother. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. You come and follow me. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Jesus gives all kinds of examples throughout the scriptures. It is a discipleship of self-sacrifice, of service, of losing one's life in order to save it, rather than working to save one's life, which will result in it being lost. Discipleship is one of taking up one's cross daily and following. Discipleship is working with people who are motivated for change. When you go to a village, Jesus said, as they accept you, work with them, perform the miracles that I have commissioned you to do. But if you come to a place that does not receive you, don't waste your time, brush the dirt from your sandals, and move on. There is much work to be done elsewhere. This kind of discipleship is in sharp contrast to the first part of the gospel that we heard today. Jesus has his face set toward Jerusalem. A key notion that Jesus is going to meet his end. He is making his way to the cross. And he is resolute. And he's coming in from the hinterlands, has to make his way through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. And he sends advance teams out to scope out the territory, and there's a Samaritan village which does not receive Jesus, perhaps because his heart, his face was set towards Jerusalem, and Samaritans and Jews, we know, didn't get along very well. They took offense, but one way or another, they wouldn't welcome him. And what did James and John do not long after hearing Jesus' teaching? If you come to a place and they don't receive you, brush the dust off your feet and move on? No, James and John say, Lord, can we, not you, Lord, can we call down thunder from heaven and destroy this village. And Jesus rebukes them. Very terse. We don't know the words of rebuke. But perhaps it was a reminder that that is not how discipleship works. And here we are in a country Divided. There is the real effect, of course, of the overturn of Roe versus Wade. But there is also, in a sense, the symbolic effect of it, that it is one more bit of evidence of the deep divisions in our country. And as one associate justice telegraphed quite clearly, it may not stop with the overturning of Roe. It may not stop with leaving the legality or not up to the states. Contraceptive care may be up for review as that was a court decision. Marriage equality may be up for review as that was a court decision. We live for now in a relatively secure state of California, a state that is using its state's rights, I suppose, to increase protections for women, increase availability. Groups are working to make sure that women who need to travel from one state to another are able to do that. Necessary, and also emblematic of deep division. As long as there have been social media, I suppose, there have been memes and chatter about secession. Texas, let him go. Who needs him? <laughs> California, let's go. Who needs us? But I don't think it's alarmist. 
in this disunited states of ours to suggest that that might not be the path that we are on. That we might be on a path, a trajectory to a third American revolution. The first being Washington and the rest, the second being Lincoln and the rest. History shows us over and over again that when conflict and disunity reach a particular point, it tends to come to a very violent head. Hence Jesus saying, pray that it doesn't happen when you're around, and if it does, head toward the hills. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I, of course, pray that does not happen, as I suspect most people do. We want to find a way through this. But there is no neat line, there is no easy answer. A few weeks ago, we heard that plot training from Paul suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. Hope does not disappoint. And right now, for at least much of this country, we are at a time of deep suffering, shock. It has long been the position of the Episcopal Church to stand on the side of women's reproductive rights. We have a proud, long history of that. Yet I expect even as much as our country is divided on this issue, so there are members of this particular denomination. It's not surprising. We are a diverse bunch. There no doubt are churches and denominations celebrating today. And there are others like ours in lament and confusion and anger. The road of discipleship is difficult. The answers are not always easy or clear. There are times when it would be far easier to call down thunderbolts from heaven on those who differ from us than try a different way, the Jesus way. Here's where perhaps St. Paul can give us a bit of help his reading to the, Galatians, the letter to the Galatians that we heard. Paul speaks of the, the sins of the flesh, and you want to be careful with that distinction between spirit and flesh, and I don't want to go into a discourse on that. I'm going on quite long enough, but Paul gives us this whole list of things that, if you can substitute the word world for flesh, things that the world promises factions and dissensions and all kinds of mischief. And Paul, of course, is exactly right. We look all around us, that is where we are. And then Paul tells us what the fruits of the Spirit are. Capital S, the translators put it. Capital S, fruits of the Holy Spirit, one could expect fruits of the Trinitarian God, fruits of the God who loves us enough to create us wildly diverse in God's image, one who loves us enough to send us a Savior to show what it is to serve and to lead. And God the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the breath of truth and good sense that guides us as we make our way along this path of disciples. What does Paul tell us? The fruits of the Spirit. If we are walking on the path of Jesus, if we are following Jesus in discipleship, fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
three sets of three, rather Trinitarian number. I would suggest that whether or not residents of this country follow Jesus are on his path. I would suggest that the fruits of the Spirit are pretty universal, much to be desired by those who call themselves Christian or not. Who would not like to live in a world where love and joy and kindness and patience and generosity and all the rest are the norm. Times like these we seem oh so far from it. How do we kindle hope? For a woman making me a delicious pate sandwich, or half a sandwich that she had to eat. How do we, as disciples of Jesus, engender hope within our own congregation, among our own? And more importantly, how do we do it out of the community, where the vast majority of people will never hear the gospel proclaimed in a church? How will you know, how will I know, if I'm on the path? By their fruits you will know them, Jesus said elsewhere. What fruits do we bear as individuals? What fruits do we bear as the church, as the assembled people of God? What fruits do we bear as residents of these still united states? Can we use the gifts that God has given us to find ways to bear good fruit? That's where I'm going to leave it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
this holy gathering and for the people of God in every place. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For all peoples and their leaders, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For freedom and justice throughout the world, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For all those in danger and need, the sick and the suffering, the afflicted and the oppressed, and those who have left their homeland, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For those who have died in the flesh, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For ourselves, our families and companions, those on our prayer list, Ashley, Carolyn, Connor, James, Ken, Lindsay, Lucille, Mana, Mark, Marianne, Ralph, Robin Jean, Sydney, Simon, Stephen, and all those we love. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For those intercessions and thanksgivings we hold in the silence of our hearts or give voice to now. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Lifting our voices with all creation, with the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. God of the prophets, hear the prayers we offer this day and make us strong to follow Jesus through every hardship. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. or anniversaries to mark this week? I know about an anniversary. You know about an anniversary. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think those, those messages that you sent out. <laughs> you do? Yes. <laughs> and it was a really good one this week. If you haven't read it, no one read it. Uh, about the ordination of the priesthood of Father Jan, which took place 16 years ago. Was it Friday? You know, it was. <laughs> Yeah, what a 
Strengthen your servant, Daniel, Lord God, with the outpouring of the gifts of your Holy Spirit, that he may continue faithfully to minister your word and sacraments, and reach out to all of your people in this community with your ministry of presence and compassion, healing and renewal, that your love may be made known and your name may be glorified. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Christ loves us and gave himself for us and offering the sacrifice. 